Aloha. So good to see you all here this morning as we worship our Father in heaven. I want to welcome all of our visitors. Thank you for choosing uh, to worship God with us this morning. We're putting him first, even though you're on vacation, even though you're on a work trip, uh, you decided to be here with us and that encourages our church family. Aloha to our church family here. So good to see all of you. Uh, those of you also who um, are Zooming in, welcome. Right after the service will be the Bible Bowl. I want to encourage you to stay if you're able to. Um, uh, the young ones have, have put in some time in learning the Word of God, and they will be tested, you know, for learning purposes. And I want you to join in. I know um, uh, Dewan and, and Tony have done a great job prepping them. Uh, for the Bible Bowl, so I hope you stay a little while after service uh, to see it. Open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I want to read verse 9 through 12. The church in Thessalonica was established by the Apostle Paul during his second missionary journey. You can read about that in the book of Acts. During his second missionary journey, uh, this is one of the places that he visited. And when he went to Thessalonica, he preached the gospel. And there were some who obeyed the gospel, who, re who believed the word of God as the word of God, but not as the word of men. But also there were some who heard the gospel and rejected it outright. Some of them took men from the marketplace and caused a riot in the city of Thessalonica. And so Paul was forced to leave uh, where the church was because people were after him. They were going to kill him and take his life for preaching the truth. And so a little bit of background about the church in Thessalonica. Uh, when Paul left, there were still sort of a new church. There were still a lot of things to be taught because you and I both know there's no way to cover every single teaching of God's word in a small span of time. I've been with you for six years as your preacher, and we have not even scratched the surface of the word of God. There's so much to be taught and to learn. But listen here in this block of text, what Paul says, the coming of a lawless one is according to the working of Satan without power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. A little bit about the context, the Apostle Paul gives a warning to the church. In this second letter, he gives a warning to the church in, in Thessalonica about a great apostasy. There was a coming, falling away from the truth, right? In other words, people that obey the truth, there was a time that was coming in their day that a lot of them will leave the truth of God's word. And there was to be this man of sin uh, that is to be revealed. And according to the text, the man of sin is coming through the influence of Satan. And I don't want us to worry about, well, who is this man of sin? Right? I don't want us to worry about that, but understand that whatever is of Satan is not of God. That whatever is of Satan is against God. But our emphasis from this text is that phrase that I put in, in larger letters, love of the truth. Love of the truth. According to this passage, one is deceived or one will be deceived who does not love the truth. One will be deceived. That, that's what it's saying with all powers and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception. Another thing too, one will be destroyed 
who does not love the truth. The word perish there, uh, destroyed or diminished. Another thing from this text is one will be delusional who does not love the truth. And that's the, the, the phrase there that God will send them a strong delusion. When you believe in a delusion, you are delusional. We see a lot of people like that today. Last but not least from this text, one will be damned who does not love the truth. All right. Uh, the last voted word there, they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth. And so I titled our lesson because this is where the title of our lesson comes. I titled our lesson, Love of the Truth. And I want to encourage all of us this morning to really examine ourselves. If we have the love of the truth. And maybe you will say, yes, I do have the love of the truth. The second thing you want to consider and examine is, is it dying or is it growing? Is my love for the truth dying or is my love for the truth growing? I'm, I want you to know that I stand up here as your friend. And some of the things I'm going to say today, you, may, you might say, well, that's pretty judgy. But I'm going to say to you, the things I'm going to say today is based on observation. It's based on experience. It's based on looking at the word of God and looking at myself, looking at the word of God and looking at us as a church, looking at the word of God and looking at some of the practices of some of us. So I want to tell you up front, I love you. And the things I'm going to say today, I say as your friend. Because I stand to be judged by God for what I say from this pulpit. When I say love of the truth, I'm not talking about love of a truth. I'm not talking about love of your truth or some, some other truth. I'm not talking about uh, loving what is true because as Christians, that should be natural for us. We should love what is truth. Uh, we should be truthful. When I say love of the truth, I mean love of the word of God. Loving God's word, because Jesus says that is the truth. John 17 and verse 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. I want you to think about some of these questions. If love of the truth is measured by how much knowledge of the Bible that you have, how great is that love? If love of the truth is measured by how often you attend worship services, how great is that love? If love of the truth is measured by your participation in the work of the church, how great is that love? If love of the truth is measured by the lives that we live, how great is that love? When we look into the scriptures, we can see these following points as points for encouragement for us. That those who love the truth will seek to know it. Those who love the truth will want to find out the truth. And Jesus said, concerning the word of God, concerning the truth, Jesus said that the truth is knowable. Don't let anyone tell you you can't know truth. Jesus says you can. 
the, the scripture that was read for us. And Jesus said unto the Jews that believed in him, if you abide in my word, the word abide there means to remain or to stay in or to walk in accordance with. If you abide in my word, truly you are my disciples or indeed you are my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. If you love the truth, you won't want to know it. You won't want to know it. Because on the flip side, if you continue in this chapter, on the flip side, there is the lie. There is the devil, John 8 and verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. And he's a liar. He's the father of it. You either love the truth or you love the lie. One of the things we read in the Old Testament is that God's people, the Israelites, were destroyed because they did not have knowledge of the truth. In Hosea 4 and verse 6, God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your God and I will also forget your children. Ignorance brings destruction. Ignorance of God's word, I should say, brings destruction. And that's what happened to the people of God under the Old Testament. Do we think for a minute that the church is immune? Do we think for a minute that if we don't know the word of God, that the, if the church don't know the word of God, that we won't be destroyed? I'll tell you, a lot of the problems that we have to deal with, it all goes back to this. We do not know the truth. There is a lack of knowledge to the truth. I thought about doing this, but I'm not going to do it because I think you know. But I was gonna, I, I was gonna, I was thinking about, man, I, I should just ask some random church members to give me book, chapter, and verse on the plan of salvation. Should I do that? I decided I'm not gonna do that. But I think you know the point. The point is, I need to know the truth because I love it. Because I want to know what God has to say. Because church, it is impossible to carry out the commandments of God if I don't know them. What about the dying world? Notice what God wants for the world. God wants men to come to know, to come to know the truth. That's his desire because the devil has done some great damage since the garden. He's caused the first man and the first woman to undermine the truth. All he said to them, you shall not surely die. And that was a lie. First Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, prioritize prayers, pray for all men, for everyone and, and, and those who are in power. And then following down verse three and four, he says this, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. When you were baptized, you came to the knowledge of the truth. But did that thirst and hunger for righteousness and the word of God, did it die along the way? Those who love the truth will seek to know it. Those who love the truth make time for it. Those who love the truth make time for the truth. Our love for the truth grows the more time we make for it. Notice the psalmist, the psalmist 19, Psalm 119 
and verse 97, he says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. What do you think about throughout the day? How much time throughout my day do I give to meditation of God's word? This man who wrote this psalm said he loves it so much, he meditates on the word of God daily. What about Psalm 1? This man loves God's word that he stays away from sin and spends lots of time in the word of God. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Let's get practical. How do I make time for the truth? How do I make time for the truth? You can start by reading the Bible daily. I know all of us coming from behind me. All of us can do better to read the Bible more. How about this one? Attend the Bible classes and worship service. Some of you, since I became the preacher, have never sat at a Bible study I taught. Some of you I don't see on Wednesday nights. Some of you I don't see at 9 a.m. for Bible study. This room is almost packed. When we have Bible studies, there's hardly anyone here. But you know who's here? Those who make time for the truth. Those who want to learn from the truth. How do I make time for the truth? Study it. Study it. Here is a scripture that will convict majority of Christians. Because majority of Christians don't know how to rightly divide the word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly Dividing the word of truth. When judgment day comes, you will not say to God, well, Lima never taught us how to teach Bible uh, to other people. Lima never told us how to be evangelistic. Lima never taught us the basic principles of the word of God. I have done that. I am doing that. Well, who's making time for it? I don't want you to stand before God and say, well, God, I didn't know how to tell my neighbor about Jesus. God, I didn't know that this was a commandment of yours that I needed to keep. Those who love the truth will seek to know it. Those who love the truth make time for it. Come to Bible studies. And, I, I, and I'm not talking about um, our members that are bedridden, our members that are caregivers, our members that are, you know, they're just not able to be here. But I am talking about those who are able and choose not. What would be your excuse? I have work. You know, the people that come on Wednesday nights, they have work too. They work. Maybe you do work at, on Wednesday nights, but, but that's a legitimate excuse. But if you don't work and you are free, don't you want to know the truth? Don't you want to make time for it? God knows what we make time for. And we will stand before him to answer on that. 
those, number three, those who love the truth, apply it in their lives. And that's ongoing for all of us, coming from behind me, going forward. Applying the truth in our daily lives is faith in action. All right? It's no good to have that knowledge of the truth when it's not mixed with faith. It's no good to have the knowledge of the truth when it's not put in action. James said this, James 14, or 2, 14 to 17. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled. Be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Application is where the rubber meets the road. I can have all the knowledge of the Bible, and if I don't apply it, it's, it means nothing. It actually means nothing. Application of the truth is doing what God said. It's, simple. it's just that simple. God said this, and it applies to the church. We should do it. And church, I want to brace you for the month of March. Because I have planned these sermons out. This is the launching pad. There are things we have not done as a congregation. And I have prepared lessons for us to study on them. There was a time in Israel's days after the restoration, after they are coming, well, not after, but during the restoration, they were coming back from captivity. And there was a famine of God's word. They didn't know the word of God. And you read about this in Ezra. And when they read the word of God, they come to find out, well, this is what the Bible says, or this is what the law says, and we didn't do it. And you know what they did? They repented, and they immediately do what God said. That would be March for us. And I, I, I like March because marching. It's time to march and start doing things that we just haven't done in the past. And no one is immune. It comes from me, from the leaders, all of us. These are lessons for all of us. But application of the truth is simply doing what God said. Here's what James said. James chapter 1, verse 22. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not ears only deceiving yourself. That's what he's saying to us. Apply the word of God. Do what it says. Last but not least, those who love the truth will teach it to others. It's hard to teach when you don't have the knowledge. You won't have the knowledge when you don't have the love. And it's, it builds. If I don't have the love for truth, I will not know it. If I don't have the love for truth, I will not make time for it. If I don't have love for the truth, I will not apply it, and I will not teach it, and not able to teach it. In Hebrews, the Hebrews writer talked to Christians, and he says to them, at this time, you ought to be teachers. But then he says, but you need to learn again the first principles. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 said to the church in Corinth, that I can't speak to you as spiritual because you are carnal. And he says to them, because you are still babes, you need someone to teach you again the basics. Don't get offended the wrong way. 
You might be wondering, what, what's the right way to get offended? The right way is when I get my toes stepped on, I, I get mad at the preacher. And that's okay. I can take it. But then later on, I see what he was saying, and I'm going to change. That would be the right way of, of being offended. All right? It's okay to be mad at me for saying this to you, but I hope later on you will thank me later and you will change. The wrong way of being offended is that you go and you leave Jesus Christ. Or you decided to remain in your current state. Some of us have been in the church for so long, still haven't taught someone else the truth. Or still haven't taught, not even the children, still haven't taught children truth. Or still not able to teach someone something from the Bible because we just don't know it. Those who love the truth know the truth. Those who love the truth spend time in the truth. Those who love the truth apply the truth. And they do teach it to others. You are a Christian so you can teach others the gospel. Maybe someone didn't say that to you. Let me say it again. You are a Christian so you can teach others the gospel. So that you know what God said, so you can say it to someone else. Hey, you want to be a Christian? Here's what I did according to the word of God. Evil men, they don't teach the truth. Romans chapter 1, 16 through 18, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, or for, or to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven, um, is revealed from faith to faith. For, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Do we know what that is saying? You know what it means to suppress the truth? It's to keep it from being spreading. It's to keep it from being said. It's to keep it from others so they can know it. We need to teach the truth. We're called to do this. It's a command to do this. God's children will share the truth of the world. Jesus said that. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. If we love the truth, church, we will seek to know it. Some of you, I see you're seeking because I see the change. I see the growth. I see the progress you're making. Some of you, I'll be frank, I'm just not seeing it. Just not. Some of us, some of us, or some of you make time for the truth because I know that you're here for it. Maybe you're making time for it on your own time. I hope so. I hope so. And if you are good, we love the truth. We apply it in our lives. Your coworker, your friends, your family members that are lost out there, they should have enough evidence that you are guilty of Christianity. Apply it. Last but not least, to teach it. This is how we bring more souls to Christ, by teaching the truth. I step on your toes today. I hope that you know it's coming from a place of love. Because I do care about us.
There are a lot of good things happening in our congregation. And pray God and, and thank God for all of that. But there are a lot of challenges in our congregation too. And a lot of it is due to this. Because the devil is trying to take away our love for the truth. Maybe you're here this morning. I want you to know the truth is the only way to heaven. It's the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And you can obey that truth this morning if you haven't done so. Hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Believe Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You need to repent of all sins. Jesus said, except you repent, you will perish. You need to confess Jesus is the Son of God. For with the heart one believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You need to be baptized, washing away your sins. And you need to be faithful to God. May your love for the truth grow strong every day you have in service to him. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. I invite you, if it's prayer that you need, it's you need to be baptized. Whatever you need this morning, I invite you to come as we stand. As we stand.